are not public yet, um, but you know, you'll get to see some perspectives of someone who's not a geek, not someone who has a particular reason to want to see it uh, succeed. That makes sense? Did everyone hear that? Did anyone hear that? No. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, that's a good start. I'm going to go back to my talk. I assumed I'd have audio, so I assumed this would be a lot easier. Um, the Department of Education sees this technology, and that doesn't just mean necessarily the XOs, but you know, this as a package, as um, a way to really introduce collaboration into the classroom. And that's one of the key things that we've um, found to be useful um, on an ongoing basis. And just ignore the people in the background. I, I can I cannot play it if necessary. It's okay. Don't worry, I'm late. So I'm going to run through a bunch of stuff. Now, I just wanted to very briefly sort of say, uh, in, in doing this in Australia, I, I, um, I'll be going through the reasons why I got involved in this project to start, but I just wanted to clarify, you know, for everyone, that when I say one laptop per child, I'm talking about this project and potentially even this project, but I'm not talking about the Australian uh, one laptop per child for nine, uh, years 9 to 12 in uh, schools. It's been amazing how many teachers you say, oh, have you heard of one laptop per child? And they say, oh, yeah, Kevin Rudd's project. And you say, well, not yet. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been important. To, it's been an interesting conflict of language that we found in, in um, taking this out to Australia. Um, the reasons why I'm involved, first of all, this is a great open source and free software project. Um, there's, uh, the way I initially got involved was watching um, and talking to Jim Geddes in 2007, who then got the organizers of 2007 um, a laptop each to play with, an XO to play with. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I thought, this is fantastic. And I went and showed it to contacts of mine to see whether it would be useful in Australia. Um, there's great people involved, of course. There's the opportunity to create a regional approach. So there's a lot of children in impoverished areas throughout Oceania, and certainly that includes a lot of the Pacific Islands, um, but it also includes um, pockets in Australia as well. There are certainly kids in remote and disadvantaged communities in Australia as well. And if we can create a regional approach, then um, children in you know, a typical school will be able to connect with children in disadvantaged areas and be able to share stories. Um, the laptops being rolled out can actually subsidise laptops to children in poorer areas. Uh, we can actually share those resources in terms of support and build up expertise in countries like Australia and New Zealand and Papua New Guinea, which have slightly better resources, and be able to, um, um, those communities and those uh, countries provide better support for the very small countries that don't have access to any of these um, any of this expertise or technology. And, and this idea of getting the connected classrooms. Imagine you know, children in uh, the Northern Territory being connected up with the Solomon Islands or with um, Papua New Guinea or with Nauru. There's some really great opportunities for cultural learning, cultural exchange, and, um, and sort of um, understanding different cultures as well. So the technology is awesome. It's a lot of fun to play with, both the software and the hardware, um, and the networks and the school server. And you know, actually putting these things in place is a lot of fun. And finally, of course, world domination. This is one of my small little... This, is, this ends up driving most things I do eventually. So the vision, I'm not going to go through this too much, but fundamentally, and there's, there's all kinds of different perspectives, but I see it as collaborative, joyful, self-empowered learning. And um, one of the questions that came up um, yesterday in Walter's talk was about whether this, you know, most of these children are going to need water and food first. Um, the fact is that most children in what we'd call disadvantaged countries and disadvantaged regions um, have the bare basics, but they can't get to the next level. So obviously, something like this or any kind of project um, that isn't meeting the bare necessity needs for a community that needs that um, isn't helping them, but this is for the vast majority of, of children in poorer areas that have the bare um, necessities met and want to be able to get to that next level. And a great quote for you, a high-quality education is the only long-term solution to poverty. And I didn't quote that person, and I should have because I've forgotten who the quote was from. <laughs> but I shall try to remember. Um, the five tenets of um, the project, just very briefly, uh, child ownership. So it's not about, you know, you get to have this if you're good, or you get to use this between 2 and 3 o'clock on a Friday. Or it's really about the child having it to use whenever they want. And this is, means the technology and the projects I'm directly involved in. Obviously, that's the XO. Uh, it's about low ages and trying to um, work with children while they're young enough to be able to really make a difference in their lives and to their communities. It's about saturation. Um, the one laptop per child 
is actually quite important, as we found, and as uh, I'll talk to you about with the outcomes of some of the projects I've worked in. Uh, it's about connectivity. This is a screenshot of um, one of the places I've set up where we've got you know, a bunch of kids in a chat, a bunch of kids in a, um, over on the right-hand side in a riot activity, another riot activity in the center. Uh, you know, they're actually connecting, and there's a visual understanding of that which starts to change the way they think about their education and how they deal with their peers. And of course, free and open source software, which is the fifth um, principle of this entire project, which, uh, from my perspective, gives the children tools to be able to go on and do fantastic things in their lives and, in, um, and for their communities. So community consultation is vital. Deployments are being done all around the world. Deployments are largely being driven by people locally, right? So it's not LPC Boston pushing this out there, although they're obviously marketing it and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's... Um, local communities, talking to t local teachers, talking to local ministers of education, uh, to families, and actually um, having a very consultative approach to whether this suits that community, how it would suit that community, and so forth. Um, I've only been, I've been involved in um, directly in three deployments now, and indirectly in about five or six. And um, every single one I've been involved in, we've certainly had a, a huge amount of co community consultation before we even started looking at the technology. The feedback is, is really important from all those different stakeholders, and it's not always going to be the right solution. Um, the support and knowledge, tra knowledge transfer is extremely important to make sure the communities are able to then um, self-support, be self-determined in how they use this and, um, and how it will benefit the children in their environment. I'm getting to cute videos a bit later. Um, so the technology itself, you've got the, X, uh, the XO, which is the laptop, um, the XS, which is the school server, which is actually a really, really important bit, and not a lot of people sort of talk about it as much, but that provides a, a huge amount of functionality, management tools, security tools, um, uh, network connectivity, proxying, and, and caching, all this kind of stuff. Um, the little device up on the right, sorry, the left, a bit confusing, um, that's an active antenna or one of the active antenna um, to just provide additional meshing. You may use normal access points, but you know, there's, there's a bunch of cool technology. And on the right are some of the power options that have already come out. So the solar, you can see the cows, I think there. You can see the cows are walking around a, um, a, a basic generator, it's cow power. Um, and then on the bottom right, you've got a, a, a draw card, a draw string, like a, what's the term? Draw something, like a, a lawnmower. And a guy using foot pedal. But there's lots of different options coming up and new ones coming up every day to try and ensure they cater for some really remote communities that don't have power or at least don't have reliable power. And some of the projects that are happening throughout the Pacific, that definitely is a requirement. So the regional vision, the idea is to try and meet the need in you know, the broader region. Um, we want to build this community in the region and there's been a, a huge amount of discussions just in the last week which is quite changed what I was originally thinking um, and what a, a group of us has been building towards. But um, there's some fantastic opportunities for symbiotic uh, relationships and deployments. So you can have a school in New Zealand or a school in Australia um, funding a school in a remote community either in either of those countries or in the Pacific and then have regular conversations, have classes together and actually be, be sharing that knowledge. It's, it's a, a really great opportunity and we're starting a couple of trials with that idea really soon. Um, but also those ongoing relationships, not only from the school's perspective, but also from the children, because that's going to give them a, a far broader perspective. And I think it helps them understand how to be good global citizens as well. So a couple of projects. There's a lot of projects happening in the Pacific. The Pacific was donated 5,000 laptops by LPC Boston. And um, they're in the process of rolling that out. They've rolled out about 1,500 now to six countries. And have really um, made enormous progress. They're working with uh, communities who either have very limited access to technology, or if they do have any technology, they're, they're not using it particularly well from an education perspective. Um, so, this is, so I was directly involved in Nui. I went and um, spent, I was only there for a week and uh, did all the technology side of setting up a deployment of 500 laptops there, which was, ended up being um, one, child for, uh, one laptop for every child on the island. Um, but it turns out that they said they wanted 500, but they actually have about 380 uh, children on the island. And um, so they've got quite a few extra, which is good. Um, but it went really well. Uh, the guys that are rolling that out is SPC, which is the Secretary of the Pacific Community, which is an organisation focused on advancement and socioeconomic development throughout the Pacific. Uh, so again, it was done very much in consultation with the local Minister of Education, um, local teachers, with the, the families, and... Um, 
it, it was quite a successful deployment, and um, we're sort of keeping an eye on that and um, providing ongoing support to them as well. Uh, there's certainly volunteers needed for a, a lot more. They still have 3,500 laptops to roll out, as well as you know, all the infrastructure and such around that um, over the next 12 months or so. Uh, Papua New Guinea have actually committed to rolling out, I think it's one for every child in Papua New Guinea. So we're talking sort of you know, hundreds of thousands of children. And um, that's going to be a, an enormous project that's kicking off early this year. So if you want to get involved, if you want to go and spend sort of a week or two off in a Pacific island helping sort of really make a difference for some kids, then there's some great ways to get involved. And if you want to find out more information about that, just go to oldpcfriends.org and you can click through to um, putting your name on the, the volunteer page. How many people here would be interested in volunteering for helping with a rollout somewhere, anywhere? Yeah, a bunch of you. Cool. Okay. Make sure you get your names up because... Uh, the people doing those rollouts will contact you, but there's also an area in there to volunteer for Australian projects as well. Okay, so I'll show you some brief... Most of the videos are actually coming from one of the organisers called David uh, Leeming, and he's uploaded a whole bunch of projects onto YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and just search for Oceana or PC, you'll find actually heaps. Um, that was actually the um, announcement... Oh, no, that's not the announcement. Uh, let's see if I can just play one. I tried playing it before, but the internet was quite slow and didn't work very What they found is they, um, they introduced them... In some of the countries, it made more sense to introduce them to the um, uh, teachers first so that you can get them comfortable with the technology so they can integrate into the classroom. In some countries, they introduced to the children and the teachers simultaneously, depending on you know, whether that was culturally appropriate and such. In Australia, that's absolutely the best way to go, because the first major concern the teachers have is, oh, it's different. Oh, it doesn't look like what the kids are used to. Maybe they won't like it. But when they see immediately the, the, the children um, do find it very intuitive and do take it up very quickly, then um, they feel a lot more comfortable. And particularly because the children will turn around and say, no, no, that's how you do it. No, no, that's how you do it. And uh, that can be both good and bad. But there's lots of videos you can go sort of and look online um, in all the deployments that are already happening in the Pacific. Uh, there's also, I'll just go back and talk through some of the Australian stuff that's happening and again, give you some videos of what's happening here. So we're doing, we've, we've basically there's a group of us that have done Australia's first trial, which has involved uh, three schools. It's not public knowledge of who they are and the details yet, but we've put all the, uh, the technical documentation online. Um, but what we tried to do is do something a little bit different. Rather than just you know, getting devices into the classroom, we really wanted to connect up children with services that they don't have access to. So what we did was, use, um, was connect up a, a, a um, resource centre, effectively, a respite centre, with remote and regional schools so that um, uh, teachers who are uh, specifically focused on literacy, on um, behavioural um, concerns on these kinds of issues, could video chat with children in these remote and regional areas and actually provide these services. Uh, the fantastic thing about this is it leads to looking at things like um, health services and delivery of, of um, other uh, interaction required uh, services to children in remote areas. Uh, so we're doing sort of trials about this and they're already starting to look at it for the, uh, the Pacific. Because you can imagine a lot of places, you know, you have to row a canoe to get to a particular island. Um, and so getting a doctor out there on a regular basis can be quite difficult. And if you can use video chat, to, you know, it's not going to be perfect. It's certainly going to have its flaws, but in many cases it's going to be far above what they currently have access to. So um, there's some really, really good opportunities for delivery of services that way. Uh, so we're the world's first trial of actually connecting classrooms in this way, using video chat and um, sort of remote um, access to the Java services and such so that the teachers can use all the different collaborative um, activities to, to talk to the kids. The other thing that we're doing, which is the world's first, which is a little bit scary and not really ready for demo yet, but um, is speech to text, so that children who have um, who are hearing impaired can. Um, well, the initial need is um, children who are hearing impaired who are in schools, and apparently there's about 3,000 just in New South Wales, um, who are just not able to participate fully in the classroom because they can't understand everything that the teacher is saying. So um, we're looking at. at mechanisms for that. But then you also get a transcription and you also get the ability to review classes and you can imagine the kind of um, opportunities uh, to solve these kinds of issues for um, high school and, and um, university down the track as well. But um, all the opportunity for a child to take their, you know, in this case an exo 
to maybe a play or to somewhere else where they need to really understand what's going on and um, maybe get that translated real time as well from the XO. But that's a, a work in progress and I'll probably have more updates next LCA. Um, there's many schools who want to participate and um, sponsor these schools in Oceania. So we've already had a lot of schools come forward and say, well, we already have a, a relationship with a, a school in sort of you know, remote um, Nauru or Tonga. Uh, can we actually help them out? So there's some really, really good relationships being fostered. And at this point, even though there's a lot of community development that is slowly in the process of happening, we already have interest from um, you know, a developing community, from direct schools just directly wanting to go and implement them, these themselves who have the skills and the capability to do that, uh, from government, uh, from businesses who are looking at ways that they can provide. We've already had a few ISPs say, okay, well, how can we help provide you know, access to some of these kids or how can we provide resources or hosting or all kinds of different stuff. Um, well, no, that's it. And I'll just quickly show you some... Oh, up on the left-hand side is a little certificate that I was given by one of the schools I was working at. It was just really cute to get there and they took me into the... Um, it was only a school of 65 children and um, I was invited into the um, assembly at the beginning of the day and um, two tiny little girls came up and one presented an award to the other gentleman and one uh, to the uh, gentleman from the Department of Education and one uh, presented one to me. And uh, it was just really, really cute. And um, so what I'll do is I'll quickly show you some of that. Huh? I didn't cry, hardly. All right. Um, oh, and the other thing I didn't put in my slides. There's actually been a, um, uh, a test, I wouldn't even say a trial, but um, eight laptops taken into um, a very remote um, Indigenous community. There were a few Indigenous families who were involved in that first trial that I was working on, um, but some computers have been taken out to, just to see uh, how well the kids in this remote Indigenous community liked them, um, interacted with them, and um, that community is now extremely keen, so we might have our first... Um, full um, uh, remote indigenous school uh, uh, project happening over the next few months, which is really, really exciting. So I'll just show you a couple of quick things. Um, considering we can't really hear it, I'll just have to do the ones which are a bit more visually interesting. Oh, this one's funny. You can't really... Oh, see, that's why full is bad. <laughs> I mean, sure, the educational outcomes are not, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Um, I'll, did everyone hear that okay? All right, I'll show you just a couple of other ones. For what it was. This is... This is um, this is fascinating. This one, we'll see if you can hear it. If not, I'll tell you what it's about. No, you won't be able to hear it. She's whispering into the camera and critiquing what her brother's doing on the computer. Oh, and now he's doing this and he's having a bit of trouble and, and with this one he's really enjoying it and he's just taking a photo and making a slideshow. And it's just really interesting because that kind of feedback is the sort of thing that's become... And I, I'm not an educator, right, so you know, please feel free to go and clarify this with other people, but um, it's become something really interesting in education to see how children think and to see you know, how they actually critique each other. And so this kind of thing has been absolutely fascinating. Um, that's about a mouse. I want to show you that. The puppet... <laughs> She's about to show you a trick and then explain the trick. Which, again, she's whispering into it so you won't be able to hear. So she shows you a trick and how, you know, it looks like the thumb is being disconnected and then goes through the process of explaining how she did it, just, you know, just so you know. It's kind of cute. Um, I'll show you some real... Oh, <laughs> Ah, um, uh, you know, there's some other sort of fun ones. Um, I took some videos of the teachers that I'm working with, uh, which was, uh, let's see if you can hear it okay.
And just to, did you hear that okay? A little bit? Okay. All she was talking about was um, using it, how, how the laptop is actually helping with base literacy. Um, the key, one of, I mean, there's a few examples there, but one of the key examples was um, a little boy who was about six, and uh, when he first came to the school about six months before, he had a reading age of about two and a half, and it hadn't really progressed particularly. Uh, he found that a great embarrassment, so he didn't like reading in front of his peers, he didn't like the group work where they were doing literacy. But because he could take his little device away and use it in lunchtime and use it at home in, you know, in private, um, and actually um, work through the exercises at his own rate and uh, not have to feel under scrutiny. You know, there's all kinds of, I guess, theories, but um, his reading age came up dramatically just in the couple of months that he'd been using this. And um, the, this particular school was really, really pleased with the outcomes um, from both the literacy and also for behavioural issues, which I'll, I'll get to in a second, that, that the children had in such a short time. So um, we've got one of the universities up there uh, critiquing what's happening and trying to um, evaluate it, so we'll actually have some good white papers come out over the next six months or so. But the very, very short-term benefits were really useful. Uh, actually, I'll talk about the other story in a sec. I'll briefly show you this, the video chat stuff. Um, so what we're using is video chat to do literacy learning. So uh, we'll start with this one. So what she's doing is using video chat. It's a very, very low tech way of using it when you think about it. But she's just holding up flashcards. And there's only, there's a very a reasonably short delay, reasonably short latency. She normally holds them up for several seconds for the children anyway. And um, a child, you know, 500 kilometers away is um, reading the flashcards, as she, actually 800 kilometers away reading the cards as she's putting them up, and uh, any ones that he gets right, she puts back in the pile, any ones he gets wrong, she puts to the side. And then what happens is she takes him through reading, same thing. She notes any words that he's getting wrong and puts that to the side, and he's just reading them through from the other side, uh, reading through the same worksheet that she's doing, but she can do this for the right activity or she can do this from a, um, a worksheet. And then what happens at the end, and this is where it gets really exciting, is... Um, So she's typing in the letter, well, well she was typing in the letter, she's getting him to spell out each letter as she writes it, and he's typing in W-A-S. And he's typing it in. So she's watching what he's doing. As you can see, he's writing it in. Excellent. he's putting it into a sentence. No. <laughs> anyway, you can sort of see the. It's a very, very basic application of this. Um, of this, but no one's done it yet, and it's really amazing. Um, she's actually found already that some of these children are reacting a little bit better because first of all they're not having this person sitting right next to them and you know, there's slightly less pressure but um, one of the things that came up in uh, that um, uh, some of the interviews with the teachers is that some of the children who don't write particularly well are finding this rather empowering. You know they're going off and they're still learning how to write because that's obviously a core skill but it's helping them feel a little bit more empowered to learn how to spell, learn formation of words, learn basic grammar, um, which is also helping with the process as well. The last thing, I think that's the last thing I'll show you uh, in terms of video-wise. Oh, okay. Um, so some of the benefits that they found. So literacy improvements, which I've spoken about a little bit. Um, ICT skills, uh, typing, uh, programming, believe it or not. We've found uh, because there's three programming environments um, that come by default on um, the, the XO um, and I think two that come by default in Sugar. Um, they actually have a lot of uh, a scope to just play. And where we found that's been really good, and it sort of comes into the behavioural ones down the bottom, engagement of troubled children, we had this one child who was 11 and he um, is apparently a, a real troublemaker and um, he's always been nice as pie to me, but you know, I bring the shiny stuff so I guess that's ex you know, understandable. But he came up to me and asked me how we could make a game. So I took him into Scratch and I showed him the existing Pong game, which is a mouse, one player, Pong. I said, okay, what I want you to do is have a look how it works and then I want you to create a two player, keyboard driven one that you can play with your friends. So we went away and he came back after about five or ten minutes and asked me one question. He asked me what XY meant. I said, okay, well, 
X is this way, Y is this way, uh, positive X is this way, positive Y is this way. So which way do you think positive X and positive Y is? And he goes, oh, here, yep. Which way is negative, you know, Y? Oh, here, yeah. So he sort of figured out in a few minutes and wandered off. And after 40 minutes, he had beta 1 of his little two-player, you know, um, Pong game in, in Scratch, which was really exciting. So for him, it was, you know, and this is a child that isn't succeeding in the traditional education model, but um, is, is able to really off and really um, get somewhere new with this, um, this new tool. So, uh, so that's been really exciting. Some of the children who have massive literacy issues and they're sort of um, 10 or 11, um, we're still getting into the Google Maps and trying to find, put places in and then you know, asking the person, because one child, I asked them all to put in their street address. And, um, and this is the older kids, the nine to um, 11 year olds. And um, one boy just couldn't get it right and I went over there and it's because he was spelling the name of his street wrong. Um, so there's, there's obviously some, some large issues there, but you know, once he figured it out, he won't forget it next time because he really wants to get to his street on Google Maps. Um, there's been a lot of collaboration. There's been some benefits in terms of math. Um, they actually, uh, the, one of the things they're using for spelling is uh, the right activity you can share. So you can have many, many people in the same right activity, um, which are seeing relatively simultaneously what each other are doing being written into the screen. Um, and so what they're doing is they're putting, asking all the children to, to participate in one spelling list. They put their name and then start spelling and then and start doing you know, writing exercises. And then the teacher within that activity can actually be correcting them and adding stuff. And, and, um, and then all the children get to save that and take their spelling list home. Uh, so they're using it for spelling. They're using it for math. They're using the memory game to remember how to do math. Uh, G Compre is on there, even though it's not the speediest um, application on there. But it works quite nicely, and they're using that a lot. And um, and they're also using it, um, in terms of the spelling, they've got buddy systems. So throughout the week, if the child finds words, they don't know what they mean on... Did anyone here used to watch Behind the News? Awesome. Believe it or not, that's still on, which is cool. Um, and, but, you know, they'll watch Behind the News, come across words they don't know, and then get, get together with their buddy and, you know, and spell it, put it into a sentence, and do exercises in collaboration, which has been really cool. And reduced truancy, that's something we haven't, we've seen a little bit at the schools I'm working at, um, but we've seen a lot of that in some of the more remote schools, because um, the school server is the delivery mechanism for, you know, internet access, for connecting with each other, for backup, um, and so they want to come to school because it's at school where they have, um, you know, first of all, internet access, of course, but where they also have um, the ability to play with other kids um, with these cool new devices and stuff. So um, in, in a lot of areas, it actually has helped with reduced truancy. So the benefits of a regional approach, obviously for Oceania, uh, broader Oceania, the islands and Pacific and such, um, uh, they've got opportunities for funding, for support, uh, for knowledge transfer and for gaining access to volunteers. There's already been a bunch of volunteers that have gone over to various areas, including me, but other people as well. Um, the benefits for Australia and New Zealand, I see the XO and also sugar on any platform as being something that's not just for developing nations, but for developing minds. And um, it's, a, it's really fantastic tools. And if we can be deploying it in a way that is also supporting uh, children that really need help, then, you know, it's, it's, and I hate to use the term, but it's a win-win situation. And um, it's useful for everyone because we're getting this broad, uh, for all the children and for the teachers and stuff, this broad cultural exchange, um, this community, and this building up of an ecosystem around not so much well, not at all, but, you know, the company, but around this vision of really taking education into the classroom. And it's bringing together geeks, uh, NGOs, businessmen, oh, business, businesses, sorry, and um, uh, politicians. We actually, uh, it's amazing how much um, uh, good um, um, goodwill there is towards this vision uh, from all kinds of levels. And I've got a cute little photo of someone that you might recognise. This was taken by, um, on the left is Senator Kate Lundy, and on the right you should know who that person is. Um, but uh, Senator Kate Lundy has one of these um, that she wanted to see if it was useful. Her, I think she's got five kids, sort of fought over it, and the seven-year-old eventually ran off with it. Um, and, you know, had a fantastic time showing it to his best friend under the trampoline, which was the dog. And so she just, ha you know, took it along to a, a meeting and just showed it around a little bit. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of excitement around. So this photo was taken from her OLPC, uh, EXO. But there's um, this requirement, this need for a global community development. So at the moment we have um, OLPC Boston, which is, you know, a company with now a lot less people working for it. Um, and, um, you know, their, their particular focus is you've got Sugar Labs, which 
fundamentally it needs to be focused on sugar. It needs to be focused on progressing and um, making sugar more and more awesome, which means that the community around it is a combination of developers and educators. But there's this massive gap in the middle. And so we need to have um, a way to facilitate this global community around this vision that don't quite fit into all two groups. So the five gaps that um, a few of us got together from around the world and identified, um, sustainable deployment support. There's currently a support gang um, based out of OLPC, which is made up, it was made up of one employee and 130 volunteers, and now it's 131 volunteers. Um, there's a need for deployment tools, knowledge and consistency to make it easy for people to actually deploy and uh, to share information with each other. So um, we've started a deployment SIG, so people all around the world are starting to get together now on IRC, meet up, exchange information and, you know, and try and help each other do awesome rollouts. Um, there's a need for managing and facilitating community contributions. OLPC hasn't done a great job of that, hasn't done even a good job of that. Um, Sugar Labs is doing a great job of that, but what if you want to contribute to hardware? What if you want to contribute to operating system? What if you want to contribute to um, documentation around um, how to roll this out on a x86, whatever? Um, we need a place for neutral marketplace facilitation because ultimately OLPC Boston is a company and they have their particular product and their particular uh, goals. We need a way for other people to be able to participate in that. And finally, XO, XS Release Manager. Um, OLPC Boston still have someone who is focused on XO release management who's just been given that role. Um, I don't know about XS. I believe the person who was doing that doesn't, isn't doing that anymore. So there's a, a need for not even just release management but around community managed and directed release management which um, is certainly a, a, a massive need right now and something we're looking at trying to build over the next month or two. And finally creating a hub for the community globally. Obviously a, you know, a, a, an organisation is... Uh, useless and it has some, unless it has something to do, but there are already at least five areas of, of projects that can start happening that people have a need for that um, happen to all fill within the same vision and the same sort of community, so we may use that as a catalyst to sort of pull together the global community. Now, how you can get involved, there's um, currently OLPC Friends is a sort of uh, regional focused organisation, it's not even really an organisation, it's the start sort of the embryo of an organisation um, that people um, are welcome to sort of get involved in. And there's still going to be projects that are, are regionally focused, but um, we're also looking now at sort of global level. So sort of coming along, getting involved is a, is a good idea. If you're interested specifically in education or specifically in sugar development, then you should definitely go out and um, get involved in the Sugar Labs communities and um, in the projects there. So you can spread the word, you can sign up as a volunteer. Um, you can contribute news pieces to all kinds of different um, areas in, um, in this vision. Uh, this Hackfest, when, if there isn't Hackfest around near you, then run one. You know, just get a, uh, in Wellington, they have anywhere between you know, four and 20 people get together every week to do bug fixes, uh, Hackfests, just you know, to do fun stuff. Um, I'm going to be running a, a monthly uh, Hackfest and demo fest um, in both Sydney and Canberra because I've just moved to Yass, but there's so much stuff I'm still doing in Sydney, so I'm going to be travelling a bit. But, you know, there's also stuff happening in Melbourne, stuff happening in um, Adelaide, and I think stuff starting to happen in Brisbane as well. Um, get involved in any forums or mailing lists that are relevant to what you're doing and just create cool stuff. One of the coolest applications is quite quite bizarre, is this thing called distance where you open one laptop, you start the application, you share it with one other laptop who now has the application started, and then you click start measuring on both laptops, and then, you know, you face them towards each other because they, one sends out a sound, and the other sends out a sound, and they just use, you know, basic physics to measure the distance between them. And that was developed by a PhD student in the, in the US who just went, well, I reckon this would be cool for the, the XO. So he sent the package, and they went, yeah, this is awesome, and now it's part of the main build. So if you just have cool applications you think would be awesome, just get involved, package. It doesn't take a lot to sugarfy a, um, an application. And, um, and you can actually contribute as part of a, a community package for this kind of stuff, and it can be used all around the world. We're trying to get more um, indigenous content and stories and even down the track language into uh, some of the projects we're rolling out regionally and hoping to get some of that content into what's being rolled out globally so that we can get more knowledge and awareness about that around the world. Um, but you can get this stuff. You can download an image, you can get an XO, uh, you can run a live CD or a USB key and just have a play and get involved and see what you know, this might be a great interest for you, this may not be of interest at all, but if you are interested, find what area you're interested in and see how you can contribute. There's a couple of little quotes for you. Um, I'll, I'll let you read them, but these are two of the students at, at one of the Australian schools I'm working at. 
Hmm? This, it's their spelling, by the way. <laughs> I just love the, but when they arrived, I thought, how weird, but they are 10 times better than any laptop. <laughs> um, these, uh, Kalu in particular was actually the one that did the software, did the games development, and um, I actually got them to start a, a page on the wiki called Kids Tips and said to them, look, first of all, you need to be really safe, make sure you don't put any identifying information, you know, all that kind of normal uh, digital stranger danger spiel that they should be learning anyway. And... Um, but then they got into it, and their teacher was, you know, consulted obviously before this and very keen for it. And we actually had, um, of a class of about 15, uh, four or five children stayed all through their lunchtime to, you know, update this page and give some information for other kids out there on the internet. And uh, it was just really exciting. Anyway, so I think what we'll do, just briefly, because I probably don't have much time left now. Five minutes? Awesome. I might... Um, Just play a little bit more of this one. I can't even see what's going on. Oh, there's a lot of me. No, it's the end. Um, that video will be made public anyway soon, um, but there's not really a lot of the just the children playing with it. Actually, I might just take questions. Anyone have any questions about what we're doing, what's being done? So um, the question was, um, Microsoft, wh what's happening with Microsoft and how, that is how does that affect the future? Microsoft, like lots of other vendors, have bought laptops and put their own stuff on it, right? Um, there was, and that's, been ha that's happened for a lot of different vendors and, you know, that, that's the way things have happened. That doesn't mean that that's what's being rolled out. And um, the best example, uh, sorry, the best um, expression of, of what this means and, um, and why, you know, OLPC did what they did was told to me by Jim Geddes, who was the um, uh, head of software development um, and someone who I hold a huge amount of respect for, which is why I asked him before sort of making the assumption that maybe this was all going to crash and burn. And he said, um, it's pretty clear actually, a lot of governments, because they're either um, misinformed, corrupt, have business interests that are inappropriate or whatever, are going to need to have the Microsoft box ticked before you can get to the next level of discussions. Right? And if that's the thing that you have to do to then to be able to say, okay, let's, let, let's do a trial. Let's show you how you know, the Microsoft works against that. They're going to assume that the Microsoft one's going to work better. And the fact is that Microsoft running on an XO runs like a dog is completely a, a waste of time. It's a support overhead and fundamentally um, none of them are going to care for it. So uh, a really good example is that, and, and I'm saying that, you know, it's a, a good how they are. And a very, very small amount, a very small amount had been committed to an XP trial for due diligence, but you'll find that pretty much every laptop being rolled out is being rolled out with the default Fedora. But it's much more tight of, of free software being one of their five principles. So from my perspective, any rollouts I'm involved in, if someone gets really, really hoity-toity and wants Microsoft XP, what I will probably do is say, okay, Let's just do a, a very short demonstration trial. And I think they'll very quickly see that it's a complete waste of time. But if they persist, you know, a lot of people say, oh, but we need the children to have Word or Excel. It's like, why? You don't need that in primary school. It makes no sense. In high school, maybe, but this is a primary school project.
Definitely. Okay. So the question is about support and what's being done to make that uh, sustainable and enduring in the community. Um, it's a really, really great question. And um, it's happening at a global and at a localized level, right? So I'll start with the global. At a global level, there's a project which is basically in support ticket community of people who are participating in that. And one thing I'm in helping, helping to, to drive is to get deployments to get you know, any trouble tickets that they can't deal with locally, to, or even some that they can, to go through that infrastructure so the knowledge is being captured and shared and accessible from other people doing deployments, and then, but also to themselves um, uh, volunteer to be part of that support gang. And I mean, they may be doing that from a purely voluntary basis, they may be doing it because they're being paid to do that local deployment that makes sense to leverage that infrastructure or whatever, but, from, but that way we actually get some shared knowledge. Plus we have the deployers uh, special interest group, which are meeting on a weekly the deployments, which usually end up being the people who provide some ongoing support, um, are sharing knowledge and share, um, to help with uh, ongoing support to some degree. Now, from a localised level, um, the laptops themselves are specifically made to be able to easily be pulled apart, put back together with a you know single screw um, screwdriver. Um, I've in the six or seven hundred I've dealt with so far, um, like directly dealt with. I've had uh, two. Uh, one that was dead on arrival, um, one that had a dead screen, so I switched those and now I have one that I can't use and one that I can. Um, we've had a couple with batteries we've had to reset and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and, and so the idea is that whenever you're doing a deployment, you're working with as much as you can teachers or maybe some of the older children, um, in particular getting, trying, trying to get high schools and such involved in helping support the primary schools in what they're doing. Um, and try to find champions in each one of those areas. Now, by having a, an ongoing connection with those communities through the uh, support groups and through the deployer seek and those kinds of things, we hope to be able to maintain some of that information. But I have no doubt that there are going to be some deployments where someone's taken on that responsibility, someone's not fulfilling that responsibility, and I still feel reasonably comfortable that things are going to be okay, because even if all the infrastructure falls apart, the children can still connect directly together and can still get a lot of benefit education-wise. So, um, you know, there's a best case you can do there, and fundamentally that's not centrally controlled by anyone, but um, ultimately th there are still some benefits they get even if all that falls apart. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And there's other cute little things like if you totally manage to screw up the image on your computer, which you have the freedom to do so, um, the child next to you can put their computer into um, um, uh, like imaging mode and it basically becomes a TFTP server for a pixie image. And then you can get your, like, so you don't even have to have a server or infrastructure or whatever and you can re-image your computer from the child next to you if you need to. Uh, so there are some really interesting things they've tried to build to make it easy for um, supporting, but also for self-empowerment of that support. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah. Is there? No, we're pretty much on time. Okay. Uh, just one. Okay, really quick. Yeah. The question is how, do, how involved is the state government department in the Australian trial? Now, even though it's kind of been on the screen, I'm not at liberty to say which state it is or anything like that, but um, extremely involved, driving it, uh, trying to see whether th this suits their needs, not only from an education um, perspective, but put it this way, the amount of money that is being spent on delivering um, specialist education to remote areas, someone having to drive nine hours to give a child a two-hour session on literacy to then have to go back there in three months or something because there's thousands of other children that need the same thing, is astronomical. So they see a direct um, financial benefit um, if this works, if it works um, well for the children because then they can provide those services to, uh, remotely from specialists who have the support infrastructure and the education and the training in Sydney to children in remote areas right throughout the state. So they have a, a direct interest plus the speech to text, being able to provide support to children with hearing impaired, um, who are hearing impaired, is also another really big um, 
uh, issue for them. So, so they're very involved, very keen, and if it works really well, it's going to solve some of their issues, which is, I think, key to this being successful. Cool. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>